Join the choir as we sing 143. <clears throat> Blessed hope, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of his faith. people said? Yeah. Remain standing with us. Steve Hensley, come here and pray for us tonight. Brother Steve Pastors, I'll always I'll get the name of this church wrong. Is it Old Fashioned, Old, yeah, Pilot Mountain Old Fashioned Baptist Church, is that it? Did I get it right that time? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> We're glad he's here visiting us tonight. I'll let him pray for us. Good to see you. Sir. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. God, we ask as we enter uh, into worship tonight that as the Word of God is being preached, that yep. hearts would be open tonight, and yes. people would hear the Word of God and accept it yes. and respond as God's Word is preached. And yes. God, I know that you won't make us come tonight if anyone needs to be here at this altar. God, you'll give us an opportunity. God, I ask if those that have an opportunity would surrender tonight and come. If anyone here needs to be saved, yes. they would take this day and accept you today. Yes. Jesus' name, amen. 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 Remain standing with me, please. Shake hands with somebody. Tell them it's good to see them at church tonight, all right?
very thankful you're at Mount Pisgah Baptist Church on this Mother's Day Sunday night service. Thank you so much for being here. Our young man's going to come. We're going to take the offering tonight. Daniel Craig, come here and pray for us, son. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for the services this morning. We ask that you bless the service tonight, bless this offering, use it to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you give. offering say a verse of scripture do either or both they can come now do that for us Conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Amen. For God. For God to love the world, what you going to say? John 3 16. What you going to say? For the Lord's sin's death. All right, it is, yes. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is set on heaven. Psalms 119.89. Amen. That's good. You ready? Uh, mm. Mm. Thou shalt not steal. Okay. Turn over your prince. This is right. Okay. Tell the world that Jesus loves you. Tell him you found a forever friend. You've opened up your heart sore to him. The love of Jesus has no end. You can choose what not to believe in. You can deny there's a heaven above. But once you take a look at Jesus, there's no denying that God is love. Tell the world that Jesus loves you. Tell him you found a forever friend. You've opened up your heart sore to him. The love of Jesus has no end. The love of Jesus has no end. The love of Jesus has no end. Amen. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus.
Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Okay. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Amen. Okay. The B I B I L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand up on the word of God. B I B I L E. Bible. All righty. Oh, how a Jesus. Oh, how a Jesus. Oh, how a Jesus. Because he first led me. Amen. Good. Good. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. Let's give them a good hand, all of them. All right. All right. Brother Dickie, good to see you and your family visiting with us tonight and some folks from Georgia, right? Thank you folks for being here tonight as well. I don't know how long I've known Brother Burr, but uh, when he pastored in West Virginia around Beckley, yes. I knew of him then, and he's been traveling for several years and, and evangel doing evangelistic work and singing. I enjoyed his songs this morning, didn't you? Yeah. They were a blessing to our heart, and Brother Burr's going to come and sing for us, and then he's going to preach for us. The children may go downstairs to their classes tonight, the two through five years of age, is that what it is? Three through five years of age, okay. We've only done this for seven years. I don't know why. <coughs> I, I, I forget a lot of things anymore. Uh, I lose things and can't find them. I lost my brain the other day. and I, My wife said it's somewhere around the house. <laughs> Do we have anybody visiting? Let's go and preach tonight or anything that you know of. <laughs> Brother Burr. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Your wife to us. Yes, sir, I will. God bless you. And I'm so glad to be here. Amen. My wife, Patsy, would you stand, Patsy? I, I've been with her for 40 years now, and she said she thought she'd go on a while longer. Amen. I'm glad of that. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thank the Lord for your pastor having me come. You have a great pastor. I mean that. And this is a great church. I don't need to tell you that, but you have a testimony that is spoken of throughout the entire world. And when you mention the uh, name Mount Pisgah Baptist Church, uh, people know about you, and they know about you all over the country. And uh, your pastor, I, I, uh, I didn't know him well in West Virginia. I met him while I was up there, and, um, but he, he had a great work, that Briscoe Run, isn't that right? And how long were you in West Virginia? 13 years in West Virginia. I was up there 14, and um, I was glad to get out, brother. I don't know about you, but I, I was glad to get out. Amen. And I, I enjoyed it while I was there and had a good ministry there. And, and uh, I, I, just, I was on a plane one time headed for California, and a lady sitting next to me, she said, where, where, Sir, where are you from? I said, West Virginia. She said, what do you do back there? I said, penance. Amen. I, I, I don't know why God got mad at me. No, I'm kidding you. How, how many folk in here tonight at one time lived in West Virginia? Would you hold your hand up? We, we got a few in here. Amen. Got one fellow back here. Don't look like he's been out long. Amen. <laughs> I, I tell you what. I, 
I enjoyed being in West Virginia. Did uh, I, I tell a lot of funny stories about West Virginians, and uh, um, I get a great laugh around the country. They they're great people, by the way, and I I'm West Virginian by choice, and. Uh, so I, I, I love the state. Now, uh, don't, don't worry much about the time. Amen. I keep track of time. I'm very conscious of it. And uh, I know what time it is. I'll tell you. As a matter of fact, while I'm preaching tonight, Ms. Jackson, I'll sing in a minute. God bless her. I, I feel so comfortable with her. She, it, doesn't she do a great job? Hey, give her a hand. Amen. Oh, great. But I, I'll get around to it in just a minute. Amen. But I, I uh, what was I saying? Oh, I... Uh, I'll keep track of the time, and I'll tell you, you know, as we move through the service, I'll tell you how long it is until the end, and I guarantee you we're not going to stay all night. Amen. I, I told that. Uh, I, I said one time over in North Carolina, I said, if you, if you look at your watch, I'll have to add five minutes to the sermon. And uh, I said, I don't want to do that. And uh, the preacher's son, about eight years old, he was sitting on the front row, and he actually took his watch off and sat on it. <laughs> Amen. He, uh, what he was saying is, very simply, I'm not going to listen to this preacher any longer than I have to tonight. So I promise you we'll get out of here and go home sometime tonight. No, it won't be very long. I'm reminded of Brother Mays Jackson. How many of you ever heard Brother Mays Jackson preach? Has he been here to this church? All right. I love Brother Mays. He's with the Lord now, of course. I used to be with him once a year in a meeting over at Brother T.D. Burgess's church over in uh, Virginia there. But Brother Mays said one time, you may have heard him tell it about when he was a young lad and um, his wife Dot, she was his girlfriend back then, and she come to hear Brother Mays preach and brought a friend with her. And Brother Mays preached that night on the 12 wells of Elam. And he got up and preached about 40 minutes on the first well. And Dot reached over and nudged her friend. She said, honey, said if he preaches that long on all 12 of these wells, we'll be here at daybreak in the morning. And Dot said, I'm not worried about those 12 wells. Said, but if he gets on those 70 palm trees, we'll be here. We'll be here when Jesus comes. Amen. So, but I, I'm not going to keep you long tonight. Amen. That's what Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband, I think. But we, we'll not stay a long time. But I, I want to... I want to uh, sing for you. You know, I was just thinking, you know, uh, if, you, if your bucket uh, doesn't last very long at church, you, you need to get you a new bucket. Amen. It's got a hole in it or something. I, I was riding down the road with my son recently, and he has a Camaro. And boy, we just ride along, and that thing, you sit right down on the road almost, and it, it, it doesn't ride like a Lincoln. I mean, it bounce, bounce, bounce up and down. He looked over and said, Dad, how do you like these bucket seats? I said, they're fine, son. The only thing is, everybody ain't got the same size bucket, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ain't it good to come to church and have a good time? Amen. I love to travel with my wife. We travel all over America now, and I thank God for it. Last week I was out in Texas, but um, I like to sing. I enjoy it. I was riding down the road one day, and Mrs. Burr was doing what she does so well. Uh, there's something about the passenger side of the front seat that folk just go to sleep there, you know, and she was sound asleep, I thought. And I was singing, going down the road, you know, Will there be any stars, any stars in my crown? She woke up and said, No, not one. <laughs> Oh, praise the Lord. I'm glad I'm saved tonight, aren't you? When the Savior reached down for me. <coughs> Once my soul was astray from the heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be. Then my Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. Oh, when the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for was lost and undone without God or heaven. 
his son when he reached down his hand for me. <clears throat> Can you hear me all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. I I, I got a big diaphragm up here, and I need all the help I can get. Amen. How my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice. In the tempest to him I then flee. from all harm since he reached down his hand for me. Oh, when the Savior reached down for me, he had to reach way down for me. I was lost Without God or His Son, when He reached down His hand for me. Amen. I must tell Jesus and uh, just play it softly there. I've been singing this song more in the last year and a half than I used to. It means more to me than ever before. I had, uh, I had uh, open heart surgery. You can go ahead and play if you'd like, just softly. Um, I had open heart surgery in 1996. I had six bypasses done. I didn't have a heart attack. I was taken into the doctor. My wife canceled the meeting, took me to the doctor, and um, had to go in and have six bypasses done. And I want to tell you something. I found out something uh, in the hospital. I found this out. Doesn't make any difference how young you are. Listen to me very carefully. Doesn't make any difference how young you are tonight. Doesn't make any difference how old you are. There will come a day, there will come a day somewhere along life's journey that you're going to need Jesus. No one else can help. No one. I, um, I appreciate my pastor, Brother Howes, and his wife. They came to the hospital to see me. All the staff of that great First Baptist Church, all the men on the staff came. And uh, my wife was there. My children was there. But I want to tell you something. Uh, it was a time when I found out I just needed the Lord. Amen. And it means so much to me tonight to know that when I have a problem come my way, I can just tell Jesus about it. This song means so much. You listen to the words of the song. A couple of verses. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear thee burdens alone in my distress he kindly will help me he ever loves and cares for his own I must tell Jesus I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus. I must tell Jesus. Jesus can help me. Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make all my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus. 
Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Amen. I tell you what, that lady there is a great pianist, and I appreciate her so very much. I, it's always a help to get into a place where uh, you, you're not worried about the pianist. Amen. I, you see, I don't know, I don't know one note of music, not one note. I, I'm telling you, when you look at a songbook and all those notes in there, that looks like little black boys going through a picket fence to me. I, I don't know one from the other. <clears throat> I was up in, um, I, I uh, flew into uh, <coughs> Hartford, Connecticut, uh, about, oh, must have been five or six years ago now, and was there in a meeting for just two days, and we got in uh, just before we had the service. And, and, and I want to tell you something. Yankees are strange people. I mean that. And uh, now if we got any here tonight, God will forgive you. Amen. I mean that. I, but um, I, I flew up there and uh, was there just for the uh, one, two services. And, and I told the pianist, uh, we got one over here. <coughs> That's right, in, Indiana. Indiana. Amen. <laughs> Well, she's south now, all right. <laughs> but um, I remember uh, the lady played for me that night. I picked a song. You know, I thought everybody had heard Under the Sun. You know, George Beverly Shea sings uh, How Great Thou Art all the time, you know, and I, I picked that one. I thought we'd get through it pretty good, and I thought we did all right. And after the service, I went by the piano, and I, I told the lady there, I said, ma'am, I said, I'd like to get with you uh, tomorrow sometime and practice. I said, you know, I, I don't know any music. And she looked back at me and said, I know. <laughs> I tell you what, I, I, she made me feel about that tall, you know. But I, I do know this much. I do know that the, it's the job, uh, 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 the responsibility of the accompanist, the pianist or whoever's with you, you know, it's their responsibility to follow you. And I want you to know, brother and sister, I led her on the merry chase the next night. Amen. <laughs> All right. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter number 16. Let me say that I've enjoyed being here, and uh, I've enjoyed the, the prophet's room. Amen. And uh, it's, um, I, I took a nap. First time this afternoon that I've had a nap. My wife tell you this. First time I've had a nap in years. I mean that. I just don't do it. But there wasn't any TV in there, you know, to watch. And so I, I don't know. Elisha, you know, he, he just needed a nightstand, a little bit of water or something like that. But a preacher needs to watch a little bit of, a, of, a, of TV, kind of relax you a little bit on Sunday afternoon. I don't take, uh, you have TV? And I, I, <laughs> I hope there's a few backsliders in here tonight. I'm not alone by myself, amen. But um, I've enjoyed the prophet's room. It's been great. It's very clean, by the way. Very, very clean. In, and um, I appreciate the fruit in there and all of that. Very, very kind gesture by the church, and we appreciate it uh, very, very much. You have Eddie Goddard ever come in and preach? God have mercy on you. Amen. <laughs> I had a place in Beckley that um, uh, we fixed up for somebody to come, and Eddie kept begging me. He begged and begged and begged, and finally I put a television in there just for Eddie. And uh, he enjoyed it so much. You tell him. I mean, and then he wasn't satisfied with just the television. I, I'm telling you, he wasn't satisfied with that. He said, Brother Bill said, can't you get cable in here, <laughs> you know? And uh, so I got basic cable, you know, so he could watch a little ESPN and that sort of stuff. But I, I've enjoyed myself very much tonight. Matthew chapter number 16. Would you stand with me, please? And let's read just a verse of Scripture. 
I'm going to preach to you for about uh, maybe about 35 minutes or so, and uh, that way you'll know you know what time we we're going to get out. Amen. I hate long-winded preachers, don't you? I I despise them, and it, it just seemed like to me the fellow that takes the longest couldn't preach his way out of a paper bag. You, you ever notice that? I and and I, I sat on the platform one night and listened to one, and I, I finally I just I just laid my head back. And I said, Oh Lord, I said I believe I closed my eyes, I could hear him better. Amen. But I but I promise you we'll be out in just a little bit. Matthew 16 and verse number 26. For what is a man profited? if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I want you now to look over into Mark chapter number 8, please. There's a companion verse of Scripture over there in verse number 36. It says, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You may be seated. Our Father, Lord, I do pray tonight that you'd bless. Help us in every way to say something to encourage someone. I pray, dear God, that we not say anything amiss tonight. I pray, Father, that everything that's said and done will redound to your honor and your glory, and we'll thank you forever. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. I want to speak to you a little while tonight on the worth of a soul. Someone said one day, "'Twas battered and scarred in the auctioneer, "'thought it scarcely worth his while "'to waste much time on the old violin, "'but he held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folk?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me? "'A dollar, two dollars, two dollars, "'and who'll make it three? "'Going for three, but no, from the room far back, "'a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow and and wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now, what am I bid for the old violin? As he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars, two thousand. 2003, going once, going twice, going and gone, cried he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not understand. What changed its worth? Yeah. Quick came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. Amen. Many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Amen. The Bible has a good deal to say about the value of a soul. The Bible says, a soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says, hear, and your soul shall live. The Bible says, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, I want to I talk to you a little bit on how, how I believe that we can measure the worth of a soul. I believe it can be measured. I believe you can measure the worth of a soul with the Word of God. Number one, I believe you can measure the worth of a soul by the torments of hell that Jesus Christ suffered in our place on Mount Calvary. I believe that Jesus suffered the supreme penalty for our sins at Mount Calvary. I believe 
believe that he suffered the torments of hell. I believe that uh, that he suffered the torments uh, of fire. I believe he I believe he uh, 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 gnashed his teeth. I, I I believe all of that suffering. Hell is a place of torment, by the way. Hell is a place where men go and gnash their teeth and gnaw upon their tongues. Hell is a place, my friend, where uh, people agonize uh, uh, in pain and suffering. But I found out by reading the Bible that the physical sufferings are not the worst part of hell. Amen. The fact that you're going to be separated from God is the worst part of hell. The Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall surely die. Now you hear me well tonight. God never forgives sin. Amen. Never does. Now that'll shock some of you, but sin is never forgiven. Somebody had to pay the sin debt. Amen. It had to be paid for. Either you will accept what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago at Mount Calvary, or you will die and go to hell. Jesus paid our sin debt. Now, the word death means separation, and of course, uh, physical death is a separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. And eternal death is a separation of the body, soul, and spirit in a place called hell. I'm talking about cut off. Amen. I'm talking about doomed and damned for eternity alone away from God. I was reading in the Bible one day. By the way, I believe the worst part of hell will be solitary confinement. You'll be cut off from everything. I used to preach when I was a younger preacher, sort of a sensationalist type message on hell. And I said in that message that if you met your own mother in hell, that you would step on her and that you would claw the eyes out of the sockets in order to try to get over your own mother and lift yourself out of hell. Now, my friend, that may sound like good preaching, but I don't believe there's any truth to it. I believe when a person dies and goes to hell, they're going to be cut off, damned, doomed, forever, separated from God and everything that's righteous and just and holy. You'll never see God. You'll never see Jesus. You'll never come in contact with the Holy Ghost. You'll never see an angelic being. You'll never see the devil. You're going to be alone in the blackness of midnight with a sensation of falling and tumbling and separated from God forever and ever and ever. You know, the Bible says that they shall be, now notice, in the book of Jude, it says that they shall be as wandering stars forever. Did you ever go out on a night and look up, not recently because it's been cloudy and rainy, but on a starlit night, have you ever looked up and see what we call a shooting star? You see it for just a minute and shoo, it's across the heaven and then it's gone and you see it no more. That's what it is for a soul to wind up in hell. They're going to be like a shooting star lost in the blackness of midnight forever separated from God. You say, Brother Bill, did Jesus suffer like that? Of course he did. Don't you remember on the cross of Calvary, my friend, when Jesus lifted up his voice and cried loudly and said, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm telling you, my friend, Jesus became a sacrifice for the sins of mankind and God who is holy, God who is righteous, God who is just, God who is perfect, God could not look upon that scene to de that day and God turned his back upon his only son and Jesus was was cut off from the Father. Oh, I'm telling you, you can measure the worth of a soul by the torments of hell that Jesus Christ suffered in our place. Amen. God loved you so much that he, he gave his only begotten son. Amen. He turned his back on his only son, my friend, for you and for me. I believe you can measure the, 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 the worth of a soul, secondly, by the love of God. Amen. 
I'm so glad God loves me. Aren't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad tonight that God loves you? The Bible says God is love. Amen. I'm so glad tonight that my preacher loves me. Dr. Jack Hiles, I understand he's been here several times to this church and um, he loves Brother Bill. I mean that. He loves me. Uh, First Baptist Church furnishes me a place to live. And they said I could stay there until I die or until the Lord comes. If something happens to me, uh, my wife can stay there. They, uh, they laughingly said if she marries again, her next husband can live with her there. But uh, we have a place to live, a nice three-bedroom uh, home to live in. And, and they do all of the, uh, they mow the lawn, they plant the flowers, they, uh, they take care of all the utility. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. No light bill, no water bill. I I went in recently. I said, Miss Bird, just cut on the lights. Amen. Just burn all you want to. We don't have to pay them. Amen. I said, run all the water you want to. Just enjoy yourself. But First Baptist Church, Dr. Jack Hiles, they take care of that for me. I remember not this year, but year before last at pastor school, Dr. Hiles honored my wife and I on Monday night of pastor school. And I remember he reached in his pocket and pulled out this key right here and held it up. He said, Brother Burr, he said that that automobile you're driving, so how many miles you got on? I said 226,000. He said, Brother Bill, tonight when you go out in the front of the church out there after the service, said there'll be a brand new 1997 Grand Marquis Mercury waiting on you. To, hey, I'm glad my preacher loves me. Amen. And I, I'm glad that my wife loves me. Now, there, I remember one time I kind of doubted it just a little bit. I mean, years ago. Uh, we were living in West Virginia, and at the time, I, I had a friend, still have a friend. One of the best friends I've ever had is a fellow by the name of Lewis Batchelor. You know Brother Batchelor. And uh, uh, he, uh, Lewis picks at me. He just picks at me. In, in five minutes' time, and I'm not discouraged often either, but if there's anybody in the world can get me down, Brother Lewis can do it. And we were meeting, we met every morning for breakfast. We'd go to the Beckley Pancake House. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I love them. Don't, don't you like a, just a short stack? Amen. Don't you like it with all that good butter on there running over the side and, and that good warm maple syrup and, and about a half a pound of sausage on the side? Glory. I'm so hungry right now. I can hardly wait. By the way, I eat every two hours whether I need it or not. Amen. But we were meeting at the Beckley Pancake House and Brother Lewis said to me, he he said, Bill, he said, didn't you sell your house in South Carolina? I said, yes, I did. He said, you got any of that money left? I said, no. I said, I've used it up here in West Virginia. That's what I lived on when I came up here. He said, uh, Bill, he said, uh, there's a rumor going around that they're going to give you that little frame house behind the church up there. I said, I know I'm spreading it all I can, you know. And um, I said, yes, sir. I said, they're praying about it. He said, how long have they been praying? I said, about 10 years. He said, he said, you better get something done. He said, you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke. You're going to die one day. And Patsy and, and your daughter, they're going to be in the street, nobody to take care of them. I, I want, if you ever wondered why people always think big folk are going to die, fat people are going to die, and I want to tell you something, skinny people, you're going to die too, amen? I was riding down the road one day and looked over to my left and there was a guy running. I mean, if you'd, have, if you'd have took all the clothes he had on and folded them up, put them in my shirt pocket, they would have made a bulge. I mean, he was so skinny, I'm telling you, had to, he'd have had to jump around in the shower to get wet. And he was running, sweat just pouring off of him and running for all he was worth. I rolled the window down, I said, run, 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 run all you want to. You gonna die too? But we always think fat people are going to die. Amen. And Brother Lewis said, you're going to die, Brother Bill. Something's going to happen to you. I went, and, and he said, the deacons are going to throw your wife out. Let me tell you, when I left there that morning, I thought my deacons were ready to vote me out of the church. I, I thought I was going to. Well, that night, we, uh, Ms. Burr and I were going to Princeton, West Virginia for the annual <coughs> Pastor's Christmas Banquet. 
And boy, I'm telling you, we enjoyed it. I, I bought our new dress. We got all, we were duded up like Ananias and Sapphira, you know. We went, went over there that night. And Brother, bro, Brother Yule Altheiser was a moderator then. And Brother Yule said, now we're not going to do what we usually do tonight. said, we're going to have uh, the pastor's wives give a testimony about their husband. Boy, preacher, I could hardly wait to see what Miss Burr was going to say about me. I mean, I'd been a pastor for over 20 years. I mean, listen, I, that's a long time. Been married to her at that time about 30 years and been a pastor for all those many years, and, and I could hardly wait. One after the other, the women in that room stood up and gave glowing reports about their husband. Now, I spent 14 years up there, and I know those women were lying. I know that. I know the men. But I thought to myself, oh, dear God, just let her tell one little tiny itty-bitty lie about me. But she didn't say yay or nay. She didn't say one word. I mean, when I got home that night, I'd never been so discouraged in all my life. I mean, I thought my, my, my church was ready to vote me out. And now my bride, I'd been married to all these years, been a pastor for all those years. She couldn't say one good thing about me. I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. Now, this is the truth, Ms. Burge. This is the truth. I'm telling it. I went to bed and could not sleep. I woke up about 1.30 or 2 o'clock in the morning, got up, went in the bathroom, and I shaved and showered and shampooed. Not a big deal for me, but I... <laughs> I did it all and put my clothes on and Mrs. Bird <coughs> peeped out from beneath the cover and <coughs> she said, what in the name of heaven are you doing? I said, well, bless God, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I said, I found out last, yesterday morning that my church is ready to vote me out. I said, last night at the Christmas banquet over there, my bride couldn't say one good word about me. You want to know what I'm doing? I'm going to South Carolina to see my mama. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> and I, hey, I did. I got up and drove seven hours. Are you listening to me? I drove seven hours in an old 1979 Mercury automobile from West Virginia to see my mother in the lower part of South Carolina. And when I got there, bless God, I found out she was more interested in those stinking grandchildren than she was in her own flesh and blood. I said, I'm going home. I got back in that automobile, headed up Interstate 77 to West Virginia. I got up around Statesville, North Carolina, and I, I was so discouraged, I was down. I looked over in the seat next to me. There was a cassette tape there by Dr. Jack Howes. And I said, well, I'm going to listen to that. I thought to myself, man, it can't hurt. I mean, I was as low as you could get. And so I stuck it in. And Brother Howes was given an, in, uh, an illustration about a young preacher that had gone to see a very old preacher who was dying. And that old preacher was on his deathbed, and the young one said to him, he said, Sir, you've studied the Bible all these many years. He said, Let me ask you, what is the most profound truth that you ever discovered in the Word of God? And the old preacher leaned up on one elbow and began to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. I said, whoa, glory to God. I mean, that, that old Mercury, I got all out in the median strip, finally got it settled down beside Interstate 77, got out of the automobile, took off through a cornfield out there with my handkerchief out shouting and praising God, hallelujah. Jesus loves old Bill Burr, hallelujah. I'm glad he loves me, amen. I'm worse something to God tonight. He loves me. Hallelujah. He loves you. And then thirdly, I believe you can measure the worth of a soul. And I've got to hurry. By the way, it is nine minutes before the hour. Don't look. Don't look. I don't want to stay a minute longer. Amen. I, I mean, it's nine minutes before the hour. We'll be through in just a little bit. I know what time your preacher usually lets you out, and so I, he doesn't preach long. Amen. Thank God for that. Amen. I can't stand preachers that preach a long time, and so we'll be through in just a minute. But I believe you can measure the worth of a soul by the sufferings of the Lord Jesus 
Look in your Bible, please, 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 18. You keep looking, I'll read while you're getting there. For Christ also <clears throat> hath once suffered for sins, the just <clears throat> for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It says he hath once suffered for sins. Now, I don't have time to go into it tonight, <clears throat> but Jesus suffered and shed blood in other places than Mount Calvary. Now, don't get nervous, preacher. I believe in the efficacious blood and the sacrificial blood that was shed at Mount Calvary, and that paid our sin debt. But I want you to know that Jesus suffered and bled in other places. For instance, in, uh, at Gabbatha in John 19, you need not turn, but uh, the Bible tells us that Jesus suffered there at a place called the pavement. That's where they pulled the hair out of his face. That's, that's where he had been beaten until his, his back was laid open. And th this is where they pounded upon him with uh, their fists. This is where they made fun of him and mocked him and danced around him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And, and, and at, at a place called called Gabbatha. And then another place that Jesus suffered was in a place called Gethsemane. And I want you to turn back to Matthew now in uh, Matthew chapter number uh, 26, please. Matthew 26. And we'll talk just a little bit here about this place that Jesus suffered, a place called Gethsemane and where Jesus shed blood. In verse number 36, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Now you ought to underline that. It says, even unto death, tarry ye here and watch with me. And the Bible says, and he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, oh, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Now, I used to preach, and listen to me very carefully, I had a difficult time as a younger preacher understanding that verse. I used to preach, and by the way, don't say amen at this, but I, just wait a while, okay? But I used to preach that Jesus being God, and by the way, he is God, amen? Contrary to what uh, the cults say, I believe that Jesus Christ, the eternal Word of God, left heaven's glory and became flesh. Amen. I believe that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. And I used to think that Jesus, being God, was able to look down through time and see what was going to happen at Mount Calvary and see all of the terrible anguish and suffering that was going to take place. And somehow Jesus cried and said, My God, uh, Father, if there, there be any other way. In other words, he, he was sort of, I used to say, well, he sort of shrunk back here. Now, let me tell you something. There's not one word of truth, not one ounce of truth in that statement. Jesus Christ, you better hear me, <clears throat> Jesus Christ never, ever one time shrunk back from Mount Calvary. Jesus Christ came into this world to die for the sins of mankind. Now, I want to take you back in uh, in the first of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, God created man and God placed man in a perfect environment. And God said, don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. He said, in the day that thou eatest thou of, thou shalt surely die. Now, I believe that the devil was there in the garden also. And he heard this conversation. And uh, when man ate of that true tree, he was separated from God. He could no longer walk with God and talk with God and fellowship with God.
But God made him a promise. And the promise essentially said this. God said, I am going to send a Redeemer into the world. I'm going to send a Messiah into the world. And he is going to be a sacrifice for your sins so that you can come back into a right relationship with me. Thanks be to God for that. Amen. But the devil heard that conversation. And the devil said to himself, he said, Now, if I can destroy the seed through which that Messiah, that Redeemer, is going to be born into this world, I'll thwart the plan of God, and man will die and go to hell. He set out to do that. On one occasion, he was almost successful. He almost completely destroyed man from the face of this earth. He sent a great, God sent a great flood at one time and only eight souls, are you listening to me? It got down to eight souls and God preserved them through the ark and he preserved the seed. On another occasion, pastor, it got down to one, just one little boy. I believe his name was Joash. He was hid by the, the, the priest, wife, and she preserved the seed through which Jesus Christ was to be born into this world. Are you listening to me? Down to one person. What a thin thread it was. But he was not successful. And now in the garden, he makes one last great onslaught against the Savior. He intends to kill him in the garden before he goes to Mount Calvary. I mean, his goose is cooked. He knows that very soon Jesus is going to suffer and bleed and die and pay. I'll send it. And he comes at him and intends to kill him. And Jesus prays and says, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup. Now, what cup is he? He's talking about a cup of death there. He said, don't let me die. Are you listening to me? Jesus said, don't let me die, Father, a premature death here in this garden. Please deliver me. I need to go to Calvary. You say, Brother Bill, have you got any scripture for what you're saying? Yes, I do. But if you don't quit asking them questions, we ain't going to ever get out of here. Amen. Turn with me over to the book uh, of um, Hebrews, please. Book of Hebrews, chapter number five. Now, as soon as you find your place, look right up here. Look up here at me. I want to give you something. Always, without exception, this is a rule, a cardinal rule, law, when you study the Word of God. It never changes. There is always, listen to me, there is always, without exception, one and only one correct interpretation of Scripture. Are you listening to me? Now, there may be different applications, but there's only one correct interpretation of Scripture. Hey, you listen to me. God is not leading Benny Hinn in one direction and leading us in another. Amen? God is not leading Kenneth Copeland and Jimmy Swigert and Royal Rapids and all that crowd in one direction and leading Baptists in another. God is not leading the Roman Catholics in one direction and leading us in another. There's only one correct interpretation of Scripture. Now, with that statement in mind, in Hebrews chapter number 5, I believe you'll agree that he is talking about the high priestly office of Melchizedek. Now, you and I both know tonight that there's only been one man to ever live 
who is qualified. Are you listening to me? Who is qualified to fill the office of Melchizedek. There's only one, listen, there's only one who is without beginning and without ending. There's only one who is the Alpha and the Omega and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now notice what it says about him in verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, that's when he was alive, amen, that's when he was walking around on this earth. That's, that's when he was there in the garden. Amen. And it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. And then it says, And was heard in that he feared. God delivered him from Satan in the garden and God let him go to Golgotha. Aren't you glad? God let him go to Golgotha where he suffered and died as our sacrifice. He was buried three days and three nights in the tomb. After three days and three nights, he arose as, as our high priest. Glory to God. And he took his own blood. Are you listening to me? I'm trying to tell you, if the blood of Jesus Christ got no further than Calvary, we are still in our sins. It is not just the blood shed. It is the blood applied. Amen. The blood had to get to the mercy seat. And Jesus Christ arose from the dead and ascended into heaven heaven and took his own blood. Amen. You say, how you know that, preacher? Don't you read your Bible. <laughs> don't you remember the, the lady came and Jesus said, don't touch me, for I have not yet ascended. He had his blood. He was on the way to the mercy seat. Thanks be to God, he suffered and bled and died and arose again for our justification. Amen. Amen. I believe you can measure the worth of a soul by the sufferings of Jesus. And then one other thing, and I'm through. And I'll be through by 10 after. Amen. Got six minutes. I'll be through. Don't worry. I mean, the preacher, <laughs> nobody tells me when to quit. Amen. <laughs> nobody. Except God and the preacher. Amen. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but I'll be through. I'll be through it in just a few minutes. Now listen to me very carefully. I believe you can measure the worth of a soul. Hold it. By the sufferings of torment that Jesus endured for us. Amen. I believe you can measure the worth of a soul by the love of God. God so loved us that he turned his back on his only son. Amen. Amen. I believe you can measure the worth of the soul by the sufferings of Jesus Christ. But then also, I believe you can measure the worth of a soul. Now, this is very important. How many of you saved tonight? Would you hold your hand? Hold it up just a minute. High in there. Hold it up. All these people in here say they're saved tonight. This is for you. You can measure the worth of a soul by the responsibility that has been placed upon each person that lifted up your hand then and said, I'm saved. The Bible says, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. The Bible says, now then we beseech, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Amen. Now I want to tell you, every person that lifted their hand and said, preacher, I'm saved. I know the Lord as my Savior. I'm telling you tonight, it is our responsibility. God has placed that upon each one of us to get people saved. Amen? And I ask people sometimes when I'm preaching, and I, I make this statement. I say, are you a witness for the Lord? And there's some people in the congregation, when you say that, they say, well, I read my Bible and I pray, and I go to church, and I tithe my income, of course I'm a witness for the Lord. Hey, that's not what I'm talking about, friend. I'm talking about confrontational 
evangelism. Amen. I'm talking about getting out into the highways and hedges. I'm talking about knocking on doors. I'm talking about telling people about Jesus. You say, I can't do that, preacher. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. The easiest thing in the world, uh, the simplest thing in the world is the plan of salvation. God made it that way. Amen. Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you try to tell me that you can't get out and knock on doors and tell people that wonderful old story right there. You can, and it's your responsibility to do that. One story, and I'm through. I wonder tonight, have you done your best for Jesus? Now I want you to think with me. Have I done my best for Jesus? By the way, about three hours before I went into surgery. I want to tell you something. When you face death, now you listen to me. When you face death, I don't care who you are. I don't care how you've lived. You are going to check up on your salvation. I am so glad, glory to God, hallelujah. I am so glad that before I went into that room, I went back in my mind 38 years ago to the 16th Street Baptist Church on a Sunday evening at about 15 minutes till 9 o'clock when I walked down the aisle and got on my face before God and received Jesus as my own personal Savior. I had no fear of dying whatsoever. But you know what I did find out? And I have a sneaking suspicion that many of you will find out the same thing. I found out that although I was ready to die, I found out I was ashamed to die. I found out that the next morning I might stand before Jesus and see him and I was ashamed because in some areas I hadn't done my very best for Jesus. Years ago, walking along the shore of Lake Michigan, two brothers were walking and talking in the fall of the year. It's cold up there. They had jackets on. And all of a sudden, they heard a terrible explosion out on Lake Michigan. By the way, this is a true story. You can look it up in the encyclopedia. There was a vessel by the name of the Lady Elgin. There was a terrible explosion. It was a sightseeing vessel. Tourists were on it. And they turned and looked. Smoke and fire coming up and people being blown into the water. People thrashing about and crying for help. and Drowning some of them. One of those young men was a world-class swimmer. He took his jacket off and raced into those cold, icy waters of Lake Michigan. He swam out to where they were drowning, and he brought back one, two, three, four, five. He brought them back to safety. His brother stopped him and said, You can't go again. You're going to die. That cold water is going to overcome you. you. You cannot do it. He tore away and went back again and swam out again and brought back another and another and another and another and another. His brother said, you can't go back. You're exhausted. You're going to die. He tore away and went back again and again and again and again and again. I think 16 or 18 times that young man swam out and brought some drowning person to safety. Finally, he stumbled out on the shore and collapsed. His brother ran to him, picked his head up in his arms, and that young man, the last words he ever spoke in this life, he looked up at his brother and he said, Brother, 
Brother, did I do my best? Did I do my best? His brother said, yes, brother, you did your best. And he died. Later they performed an autopsy and found that the young man's heart literally exploded, burst inside of him because of total exhaustion, just doing his best for Jesus. Would you stand with me, please? Going to ask the musicians to come very quickly. I'm not going to ask you to sing tonight. I don't want you to hold a songbook. I don't want you to do anything. I, I just... I just want them to play in just a moment something appropriate, something that when people hear the music, they'll be able to relate to the words of the invitation song, something very familiar. Now listen to me very carefully. Look right up here. There may be someone in here tonight who's lost. As far as I could tell tonight looking around, I, I don't see as well as I used to. But it looked just about like every hand was raised tonight. But I'm asking you a question tonight. Have you done your very best for Jesus? Or do you need to come as I did October the 12th, 1996, when I looked up into heaven and I said, Dear God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's a lot of things that I left undone. There's a lot of things that I did. Maybe a harmful word that I spoke. Maybe I hurt someone. I have done it, Lord. And I want you to forgive me. And I said to him, I said, Lord, if you let me live, if you let me live, I'll do better. I'll try to do my very best for you. Sometimes I get tired. Mrs. Burr and I travel every week of the year. We travel from California to the East Coast. We travel from Maine down into the lower part of California, all out in the Midwest and everywhere. I have some grandchildren I'd like to see. I want to see my newest grandson over in West Virginia. I'll get to see him tomorrow. I'm happy about that. Sometimes I think I'd like to just go home and sit down in my easy chair. I thought today how much my wife would have enjoyed having a home where we were there and our children could come over and visit with us. But it's not like that. I promised God I'd do my best and that's why I keep going. That's why there's no stopping place. And I'm asking you tonight, are you doing your very best for Jesus? If not, maybe you ought to have come quickly tonight just to say, I'm sorry, Lord. And I promise you, I promise you, Lord, I'm going to do better. Father, bless this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Would you play, please, and would you come, please? Would you come? Yes, that's right. Come on. Come on. There, there's nothing wrong with walking an aisle. You're going to face Jesus one day, maybe sooner than you think. The man that left here today driving up to West Virginia to see his mother, he didn't get there in time. I understand she died about 12 today. He didn't get in there until 3. She's already on the other side. You don't know when you're going to meet Jesus. Would you come tonight? Would you come and just promise him to do your best? Admit that you failed him. You haven't read your Bible like you should. You haven't prayed like you should. Oh, this is a good crowd tonight. I doubt very seriously we have any drunks or harlots or whoremongers in here tonight. But there's a lot of times when we could do a better job and we just don't do it. Would you come? Would you come? 
Thank you, preacher. That's all I have. God bless you. Just stay right where you are. We're going to pray together. Our Father, Lord, thank you for these folk that have come tonight. I found out wherever I travel and I get to meet the people and be around them for a little while. I found out so many times that the best people in the church, Lord, are the ones seemingly that come first and get upon their knees and acknowledge that, oh, I failed you, Lord. Thank you for these that have come. Lord, there are others in the congregation tonight. They didn't feel moved to come to the altar, but I know in their heart right now they're praying and saying, oh, God, help me. Help me. I want to do my best for Jesus. Father, bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, preacher. While our heads are about, our eyes are closed just for a moment. They're going to continue to play for us. If you're here and you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. You ought to trust Christ tonight. You're valuable to the Lord. He gave himself for you. Paid a great price for you. We'd, be, we'd like to help you. If you'd come now, we'll take the word of God and show you how you can be saved. How you can know it. I want you to come. This is the church you'll be a part of. You are to come tonight. You need to get baptized or set a time to get baptized. You are to come tonight. You need to make public you've been saved. I want you to come. You can come while they're playing for us. While we're waiting just a moment. Need to still come and pray about something? Your heart and life? I want you to come. Thank you, Brother Burr, preaching to us and singing for us. I enjoyed it today. Why don't you step to the middle door back at the back so our folks can shake hands with you. You leave. Take your wife with you. I appreciate Brother Burr being with us today, don't you? Amen. Amen. Do something a little different tonight. I want you to think about what was said. I want you to go home thinking about it, about doing your best. Some we all need to think about, isn't it? I need to think about it, and so do you. God bless you. Have a good day. We love you. Thank you for coming. I want you to think. Wait a minute. Oh, yes, I need to tell you something. I'm sorry. Brother Burr mentioned it, but I need to tell you this. Brother Carl Brocious left this morning to go see his mother. Uh, she'd been real sick, and she passed away at 20 minutes till 12. Brother Carl didn't get there in time to see her. But you'll need to pray for him. Pray for that family. When we find any arrangements out, we'll let you know. All right. God bless you. Pray for them. <laughs>